Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Off Planet Radio. I'm Emily Moyer. Uh, Randy is off tonight. He had a prior commitment, and so it'll just be me flying solo tonight with my guests, and we'll get right to it. Um, uh, we are recording this on 4th of July, and I love the irony of tonight. So because of what we have for you, we have a returning guest, one of our favorites from last year. He is the founder of the Conscious Resistance, the Houston Freethinkers, author of Manifesto of the Free Humans, and he is currently making his way around the country with his Decentralized Your Life Tour. There's nobody I'd rather spend 4th of July with than my favorite meditative belligerent, Derek Bros. Welcome back to Off Planet Radio. Hey, thanks for having me back. And that's a great intro. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm really glad to have you back. Um, I love a lot of the things you've been doing. And um, yeah, so let's, uh, let's just hop right into it, man. We have a short, uh, short amount of time tonight. Um, I love the irony of having you here on 4th of July. Um, I was telling everybody today that, yeah, I love that I have Derek on the show for tonight since it's 4th of July. Um, do you find it, I'm, well, it's not weird, I guess, with all the things we know, but in a few, uh, few hundred years, this country, if, you know, if the founders intended what they said, just had problems with it anyway, when they founded it, we've become everything we were trying to escape from, or that they were saying that they were trying to escape from when they broke away from the British Empire. We are now, um, in most ways, worse than the British Empire and in cahoots with them still and ally with them on everything. Uh, what do you think about that? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I didn't. I didn't realize at first that we were talking today on Independence Day, and uh, you know, I've I've made it my obligatory Facebook post to kind of be the contrarian opinion. And you know, I, I on one hand, I get people who are just like, "Why don't you just enjoy this day, regardless of what is wrong with the country or what it's about? It's just supposed to be about celebrating, you know, family and things like that." But I really feel like. The, the truth of this day of what it was supposed to mean originally, even as imperfect as it is, like you mentioned, you know, the fact that the, the American Revolution really wasn't one for everybody as far as women and people of color um, who were still restricted in a lot of ways. But generally the idea, you know, this sort of revolutionary rising up against the centralized power in the form of the king, you know, those actions involved breaking the law and involved tax evasion and vandalism and rioting and fighting the cops and doing things now that are just generally shunned by the average American you know every time somebody out there protests in any way they're like oh why are they out there blocking those streets or you know I think silly things that I, I wonder if they were these people were around during the Amer American Revolution if they would have been the type to condemn the um, you know, the, the revolutionary fighters. So yeah, it's definitely uh, an interesting time to be alive and to be here on this, you know, this particular time in, in our history when things feel very divided, Yeah. Um, you know, and, and, and maybe rightfully so because there's a lot of injustices in this country and uh, it's disturbing to see the splitting and, and to see the possibility that could come from this. But at the same time, um, you know, because as I said, some people were just like, just just take take a day off. Don't be so grumpy on independent <laughs> something like that. And to me, it's like, well, it's not. I'm not sitting here. Like, I'm having a wonderful day, like I do do every day. I try to celebrate life and my freedom and all those things uh, every single day that I exist. But I just have a problem, and I feel like it's almost kind of like a colonization of the mind when yes. we allow ourselves to celebrate whatever it may be, family, freedom, uh, you know, joy, whatever based on somebody else's idea, in this case, the state's idea of when you should do it. Like, this is the day you should be upset about this. This is the day, the month you should celebrate your pride about this. This is the day you should call your mother and call your father and all these kind yeah. of things. Uh, I, I really don't do well with those sort of societal pressure type things. It's like, if I'm going to celebrate the, the place I live, then I'm going to do it on my own time. And the other problem I have and it, it's just – Again, people don't really seem to think too hard because when I asked a, a good friend who's like, hey, you know, you don't have to uh, love the, go the government to love the country you're a part of. And I said, well, when you, when you talk about country, are you talking about the landmass known as the United States 
between Canada and Mexico? Or are you talking about a cultural thing? Like, is it literally just the land that's here that you're in love with? Or like, because I, I feel like, again, people don't think that deeply about it. They're just like, I love my country. But what does country mean? What is, you know, what is this idea, this sort of emotional mindset? And there's a lot of nationalism. There's a lot of faux patriotism mm. going around. And uh, I think a true patriot, as I'm sure your audience knows, is the kind of person that questions things and doesn't blindly yeah. accept them. Yeah, patriotism as it's functioning in this country right now is really nothing but a mind control program. You know what I mean? It's not, um, you know, it, it's a get in line thing as opposed to step out of line and question things type of uh, idea. Uh, my friend Danny Katz, who's an artist, had some great posts today. Um, she does these kind of artistic posts with, uh, posts with quotes. And today's was, um, flags are bits of colored cloth that governments use first to shrink wrap people's brains and then as ceremonial shrouds to bury the dead. And I thought that was, um, wow. that was pretty... Uh, Pretty, pretty fitting. Um, anyway, yeah, I agree with just about everything you said there. And um, I too, I resist all of these kinds of holidays. Like the people I love, I love them every day. I do, I think about them and do nice things every day. I call my mom whenever I think of her, not just, you know, any of those things. So absolutely. Um, since we're on the topic of some of this um, divide and pol political kind of stuff, um, you, you've had some conversations and some posts over the last, you know, and, and videos over the last few months about this sort of unholy alliance that's happened between some members of the alt-right and certain parts of the libertarian or quote unquote freedom or liberty movement. Um, and I was really glad to see you engage in those debates because it's something I'm uncomfortable with as well. I feel like it's, um, you know, I'm sure that there's people who are doing that, that are doing it for many different reasons, but I see it as like almost a, they're fatigued from, from this, you know, journey that we're on or this fight and they're going, well, I'll just sort of settle for this. This accomplishes a little of what I want and the other stuff isn't so important. So um, why don't you let, tell for listeners, let them know what you're sort of seeing here and why it's such a bad idea. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, this is definitely something I've tried to address uh, since I guess mid 2016. If you go to the Conscious Resistance YouTube channel, there's a video I did on debunking Richard Spencer, and I also debated uh, another author, Christopher Chase Rachels, who, um, you know, has really, is, is a prime example, I think, of these kind of people who've gone just extremely right in the last year or two, last two years, uh, for various reasons, as you said, you know, some of them believe they have some kind of uh, logical, rational, uh, you know, line of thinking that has led them in this direction, but there's others who are obviously and clearly and openly bigoted mm -hmm. in their views and yeah. make no, you know, qualms about hiding it or anything like that. Um, and so there's a mix of people there. And uh, I've definitely tried to do, to do my part, both in the latest book that I released, Manifesto of the Free Humans, and through these video series and a debate with Christopher Chase Rachels, tried to put whatever sort of weight my words or my influence may have on some people and get people thinking and understanding like if you're really about this message of freedom and uh universal freedom for all people and, and, and what i mean by that is allowing each individual to be free to choose the uh, the destiny and the path that they will take in their life if you're really about that then uh you know you have to accept that people are going to uh live ways that you might not agree with you know and yeah. these people are instead like you said, they're, they're falling. It's like they're giving up and now they're absorbing what Sam Conkin would call anti-principles and just basically trying to find rationales for completely backwards ways of thinking that have nothing to do with freedom and have a lot to do with empowering the state and, and growing the government and trying to twist these ideas to make them conform to some sort of yeah. appearance of being libertarianism. And uh, these people, Chase, Christopher Chase Rachel uh, is one of them particularly, are doing a very great job of trying to divide this movement, you yes. know, and, and I got involved like many people during the, the Ron Paul time. I just started kind of in Houston working with different activists who would consider themselves to be Tea Party members or some of them worked within the Republican Party, but they were definitely actually, they were anti-war and they were these kind of things, anti-drug war. Uh, but even then I realized that, okay, some of these people tend to be more conservative than maybe I particularly am, which yeah. is fine. And then I realized it was, okay, there's some people who are also among this crowd who like, you know, they like to smoke pot or they're, you know, a little bit le more liberal when it comes to like, you know, uh, um, same sex marriage and things like that. But generally all these people came together under the same banner to support somebody like Ron Paul and to support this principle and this ideal. And then now in the last couple of years, it seems like people haven't really been sure which direction to go. And, and 
you know, some people unfortunately are still looking for a leader and yeah. there's people who are trying to take advantage of that and saying, Hey, we're the real libertarianism. It's this direction. It's this. And all those other people, they're the fake ones, you know? And it's just, yeah. you know, I think that it's, 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 necessary to some degree because you know some people out there don't want any end fight and they're like oh you guys are hurting the movement or whatever blah blah you know i think it's important to weed out the uh, less than pure less than principled people and yeah. that's i think what's happening as well and in their eyes they're like oh we're weeding out all the people who aren't willing to go you know as far as we are yeah i'm, I'm not just saying that these are you know right-wing-ish people who are more right-wing than i am i'm talking about people who are openly advocating authoritarianism and on the right and the left. There's people on the left that completely advertise, you know, like you could say. Yeah, exactly. I mean, so these, yeah. These individuals, though, are trying to take the liberty, freedom movement and say, you know what? The left is the entire problem. Yeah. We have better luck working with conservatives. So we just need to focus on, and, you know, these people spend a lot of time just bashing yeah. uh, left wing people. And again, yeah, like it should go without saying, I have problems with authoritarians and statists on the left and the right. So I'm not really favorable to one or the other, but yeah. I also know that there are people who may come to the message on both sides, all yeah. sides, and those who see themselves as beyond the spectrum. But this type of thinking and these kind of people and this infiltration and really what I consider to be yeah. an infection of these alt-right type thinking people or these libertarians who once were consistent and now have gone away, gone away, gone away, away. Uh, I'm, I'm thankful to see that the role that I've been taking um, it seems to have helped some people, you know, people like yourself have reached out and said, thank you for speaking up about this. This is important to me. And it's freaking me out to see all these kind of people go in this direction. Yeah, because if you're just supportive of this movement and you're watching and all of a sudden people you've followed for years or read for years start saying some really anti-freedom stuff, it's like, whoa, what the heck's going on? And at the same time, they have the, the power to influence people, you know? And yeah. so I want to use yeah. whatever influence I have to help people see that, Hey, we're all not out. Not all of us are out there trying to call for, you know, some ethno white state yeah. or whatever border wall or whatever these people are calling for. Yeah. So I'm just doing my part to try to remain consistent about that. And at the same time, you know, you mentioned the moving beyond the libertarian movement. I also at the same time am realizing that this message that I am putting forth with my latest book that John Vibes and I co-wrote and on the tour, the Decentralize Your Life tour. Uh, the message that we started to call holistic anarchism. Yeah, I've yeah. seen already that it has a, a reach that is much more broad than just the simple uh, individual libertarian message. And um, you know, I have multiple reasons why I think this this is happening. But generally, uh, I, I speak to you know radically minded college kids and to soccer mom suburban you know women and everything in between yoga yogis and meditators and you know anarchists and all this stuff and i'm realizing wow okay i'm finding different ways to speak the same message sometimes i'm giving talks and i don't even say the word libertarian once or yeah. anar anarchism yeah. even and i'm just explaining the concepts and the ideas and getting people to understand the value and taking their life into their own hands and things like that and so, yeah, I've just been realizing more and more along with this sort of infighting bickering, which, as I said, it's necessary to weed out certain yeah. people. But after a while, it does sort of become, you know, unproductive because people who are new to the message, have, they're just like, what the heck is going on? All these people are like, and at the end of the day, I'm like, okay, we really need to humble ourselves because we're just like some you know, subculture of people on the internet in America and one single blip of time and, and, and history yeah. in the grand scheme of things, you know, it's like, oh, who do we, we're like arguing about theoretical futures that may or may not happen. So it's, it's silly on one hand, but at the same time, it shouldn't be completely discounted because the reality is that throughout history, dangerous ideas, when they're ignored, they can take root and they can have some, you know, very dangerous uh, implications. And so, you know, these, these people shouldn't be completely ignored. But I am also looking beyond the libertarian movement and trying to take my message and use this tour as a springboard to not only uh, speak to a wider audience through the internet, but also through my speaking engagements and such, start reaching out to different types of festivals and conferences, not just explicitly anarchist or libertarian conferences, and trying to find a way to talk to people, you know, whether that means a crowd of peaceful parents or a crowd of um, health advocates or a crowd of cryptocurrency um, enthusiasts finding a way to still get them to understand the decentralized message, you know, no matter which crowd I'm speaking to. Yeah. I want to say a couple of things, you know, uh, 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 echo. Um, so uh, just back real quickly to the whole 
alt-right libertarian thing. To me, I see the only way for there to be any kind of working together is if, you know, in, in the kind of world that we imagine, without authority, without government, there would be intentional communities. There would be, you know, that kind of thing. And then people can go off and do whatever they want. But in the world that they want to create, there's no room for people like us. But I think the reason that they resist this is be, for, for fear that some of the people that they have kind of gotten under their spell, that that's a good idea, if they went through the actions necessary to create a free state, would, not, would no longer hold some of these alt-right or you know, white, white supremacist or ethno-nationalist kind of views. If people really understood uh, on a complete holistic level that the message of freedom, the message of anarchy, they wouldn't think those things anymore. And I think that's why they're not okay with everybody having their own kind of thing. They want authoritarianism. Um, yeah, see, they can't handle the, the real, true, free market competition of ideas in the yep. market you know and I also do think and this is just my personal speculation but um, I think there's truth to it uh, that these type of people and this is based on my interaction uh, again debating these people like Christopher Chase Rachels and debating a bunch of them just via Facebook and commenting back and forth that <clears throat> they seem to be um, they seem to be kind of harboring some internal anger and like mm -hmm. undealt with like hate you know, is really just, I think it's just, it's like that darkness, you know, they, they feel strong through, you know, to, to reference Star Wars, they feel strong in the dark side, so to speak, you know, where yeah. they're like, they think that they're like, they've got all these statistics that they sort of confirm their own biases yeah. about what they believe about the world. And then, um, you know, they uh, sit there and, and think that they have the enemy pointed out, it's the left. And yeah, the state's kind of important, but really it's those leftists. Yeah. You know? or it's immigrants or it's the non-whites or whatever these different groups are worried about Muslims, it, I mean, whatever, I've, yeah. I've listened to their different talks and literally these people say like i hate them i hate the media I, hate, I mean they're just like so much anger in there which i can understand to a certain extent but if you allow that to corrupt you into uh really it becomes a poison and totally. i think that's what we're dealing with is some people who have some deep-seated issues and yeah like a lot of us do, you know, that we're, we're all processing and we're all working on things. But if those things don't go properly dealt with and managed, then, you know, it can be very easy to be manipulated when someone says, here's the enemy that you've been looking for. You know, you fall right into that trap. So it's a dangerous, it's a dangerous thing. Yeah, I think that there, this uh, sort of inner anger or like these inner sort of undealt with feelings actually they actually poison any of the good points, which there are a few, there are, they have a few points that are actually fair, but they're so colored and poisoned by this anger and resentment that you're talking about that it almost makes it not matter, you know? So yeah, so um, then moving on, you talked about the moving beyond the libertarian movement, which I loved your video on that recently. People go check it out. Um, I've always found, while I agree with a lot of points of libertarians, I've, I've always found it somewhat constraining because to me, like the overall sense that I've always gotten from that movement is it's, feels, and I'm not even saying this is like a fact or what their intention is, it always felt so focused on economics, so focused on the market will solve everything. I'm just not that obsessed with money. And so, so much focus on that made me less inclined to want to, you know, involve myself with them or pay attention to them. And I feel like what you're talking about here, a holistic anarchism that, you know, include, addresses many other things by, besides just markets and financial situations and how we'll deal with currency and whatnot it's really a full wellness of our own bodies and our own like system as a whole that is much more um, appealing to me. So um, I really like that, that term and I'm glad you're using that. Um, okay. So let's move on. Um, I also, you've been, um, you've been covering the Dakota access pipeline situation from the very beginning and you're one of the few, at least in sort of our kind of underground media kind of community that has continued after the major, you know, actions, or the major actions that were covered by the media and whatnot not seem to subside. Can you give us an update on um, what's really going on there and the things that are happening now that nobody's really paying attention and why people should still be paying attention? Sure, yeah, I definitely am very thankful and blessed for the opportunities that I had to go to Standing Rock to meet all the great people I did and to be a part of that both as a journalist and as uh, a native person and as a, just an activist. It was a historical time and I think for a lot of people it's continued to spark interest and in not only pipeline resistance and environmental activism but uh, native indigenous activism and sort of reawoken that spirit. So I'd say it's, it's a victory on that front. As far as what's continued to happen uh, you know in the months since Trump's taken office and 
uh, the pipeline nears full completion. I don't think it's completely operational yet, but they've already had two small spills in the months leading up to that, uh, that they, the company claims, you know, didn't cause any damage to water and wildlife or anything. And at this point, unless activists are going out there and looking for themselves, which is pretty difficult to do, it's probably illegal to get on that land where the spills are at. People are pretty much reliant on their, the company's word and what they say is taking place. Um, uh, other developments that have taken place have included the, the, uh, the website, The Intercept, Glenn Greenwald's The Intercept. They obtained, I think, 100 pages of documents from various private contractors who are working with the Morton County Sheriff's Office, including Tiger Swan. And Tiger Swan is a private contractor who started out in Afghanistan, like many of those contractors working alongside the military as part of the global war on terror. And basically what these documents show is that Tiger Swan, along with several other private contractors, were hired by the Morton County, Sh County Sheriff's Office to help them with uh, containing protesters, water protectors. Specifically, Tiger Swan is known for their counterinsurgency work. So they were, you know, this is all telling on how, when you really look at these people's documents and their words, it's telling on how they look at activists and anybody who's going to prepare to fight back, whether it's a pipeline or some other sort of project that they want to oppose. They studied the pipeline resistance and the Standing Rock opposition as a counterinsurgency operation, they said. And they basically said in their own documents that they believe they have come up with a successful model for fighting counterinsurgency operations. So in your own country, you know, when you oppose something and you gather together and you organize to try to fight it, like they're, they're coming at you as if you're counterinsurgency and they're, they're using military tactics that started in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan as part of the war on terror. And uh, these documents also showed that like many, most of us suspected, at least Tiger Swan and probably all the private contractors were involved in this in some way. Tiger Swan definitely, though, was involved with um, stealing uh, communications radios from the security at the sites on the camps. Um, they were involved with aerial surveillance and cell phone surveillance and uh, just sending in fake activists to infiltrate and listen in on meetings and things like yeah. this. So everything that we, we should expect. And the yeah. thing is, I say should because activists who are going to be organized, if you plan to get organized in your community or on the street or go out to something like this, you just need to be very aware that you're not safe out there. You're out in the public and especially when it's a big open thing where anybody can come in and out of it, it's very easy for a cop to do that. Uh, so that was revealing and when that came out, I reported on that and kind of kept that in the back of my mind because um, you, you may remember that I, when I reported, there was the night of the fires. Yeah, I was going to go there next, so I'm glad you're going there. Please. Yeah, there was the night of the fires where I stayed up to like three in the morning just videotaping this kind of skirmish between water protectors or protesters of some kind and the police, uh, the, it looked like National Guard. And I stayed up there filming the whole night, and as I reported at that time, the police threw some smoke bombs and then they parked their vehicles there, these hum these like military style Humvee vehicles and then left and just left and left them there to be set on fire. And of course the next day everything got reported as the protesters set fire to these vehicles. And when I reported and wrote an article and, and released a video report for Met Press News, I kind of posed the question as, as much as I could without just you know speculating too hard, but it seemed fairly obvious if you know the research and you know how these, these methods work that it was quite possible that this was probably a setup and that this could be anybody from the Morton County Sheriff's, a private contractor. It could be somebody hired by uh, energy transfer partners because corporate companies also do this as well, just as the state does. And so I speculated that this is possible that some, they purposely set their own vehicles on fire. And then we saw those documents come out. And then after that, uh, a woman who worked for another private contractor who was dating a man who was also working for the private contractors she came out and basically started whistleblowing through her Facebook and, you know, said, Hey, my dapple buddies, like I'm going to release some information tomorrow, you know, and just started releasing through interviews with local, a local paper there in, in North Dakota saying that, yes, uh, at least one or one of the companies that she worked with sent out its own people to go light vehicles on fire. And so there was things like that happening when we were out there, they would, they would you would see a vehicle on in this, in the field, like one of the um, construction worker vehicles would be set on fire and they would be reporting, look, the activists are setting vehicles on fire. And then, you know, so I, I don't have the hundred percent of the evidence, but with the video that I put out, which yeah. by the way, the video is out now on the conscious resistance. I figured like, okay, well, I've held on to all this footage this whole time. This might be time to go ahead and release it. So I released 
um, you know, all the footage I had from that night and, and sequential orders. So people can see, here's what I witnessed. And, and uh, it aligns with what she says. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. It goes, it yeah. goes in line with what she said and what I first suspected back in October. And she had no, no knowledge of your video and you had no knowledge that she existed. So no, I had no idea. I've never spoken to this woman other than just reporting on her, her work. And I'm, and I'm glad she chose to speak out. Yeah. Uh, but you know, this is just, it's par for the course these days when dealing with, um, yeah. something so big like big oil or the police state or any of those mechanisms of power. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for being, um, you know, completely, uh, persistent with, with this story. Um, and we're going to kind of detour off into something else right now. Um, I suggest everybody follow Derek, um, Derek Rose on Facebook. I enjoy uh, his posts. He posts quite a bit in sport. Sometimes he posts a lot and other times not so much but he posts about um, ideas, actions, big and small, and he is very good about interacting with people who are commenting on them. And he had a post the other night that I really liked about what, what seems like a small action, but could actually, you know, if people kind of caught on to this, turn into a big action. Why don't you tell us what happened to you at a restaurant the other night, Derek? <laughs> yeah, you know, I, like you said, I do, I do kind of share sort of uh, in spurts on social media. I get a bunch of thoughts all at once. Uh, but yeah, I wanted to share just a story via social media about going out to eat with my partner, Miriam, and basically as part of the tour, which I'm, I know we're going to talk about in a few minutes, you know, yeah. I've been becoming more and increasing, just increasingly conscious of my behavior over the last couple of years as far as environmental actions. And, and really, that's part of the holistic message is to get your actions and your, your thoughts and everything, like your spiritual, mental, physical body and everything related to that, your actions, the way you make money, your jobs, relationships, all that stuff in line with your beliefs. And uh, there was a couple times, we just released a video last week, uh, the Freethinker House number 19, which is basically us kind of just getting back from the tour and we're digging through our trash. As part of the tour, we're saving all our trash while we travel so we can uh, look through it at the end and basically see how much waste we're producing. They say that the average American produces four pounds of trash per day and I have uh, you know, some good friends who are very committed to a low waste, as close to zero waste lifestyle as possible. And it's a beautiful thing and it just takes effort. And as you're saying, it takes like building a movement of inspiring people to take these actions. Uh, but so we figured, hey, let's try to be more conscious of how much trash we're producing. We're gonna keep it all with us. Everything that we buy, everything that we use, whatever is just put it in your pocket till later, then we'll throw it in the bag in the back of the trailer. And, you know, by the end of the tour, we brought it home and we poured it all out and looked through it and got to see like, oh, here's actually trash. This is recyclable. This is compostable, whatever it may be. So just being more conscious of that and definitely some of the worst things that exist out there and that I hate using is styrofoam. You know, it's just such a wasteful product that has very little reusable options you know and it's and, bad for you too yeah it's bad for you like, you don't want to be putting your food in it it's bad for the environment like it's not there's just so little you can do and it doesn't break down easy it's not like it's just going to break i mean it's, so it's a it's very bad so we're out to eat and we're starting to get full and there's still food on our plates and just kind of looking inside the restaurant i see i'm like oh man all they have is styrofoam containers and i was you know we had just gone through our trash a couple of days before that and made that video. So I was just, that was on my mind and I'm sitting there kind of just playing out the options of like, all right, what can we do? How can we, you know, not lose this food? Cause I don't want the food to go to the waste either and just get thrown away. Um, and so I just kind of like asked Miriam, I'm like, what do you think about just taking the bowls and stuff like, like hey, let's condense as much as we can onto one plate and let's take it and like and we'll bring it back because this is a place in like my neighborhood it's not far away and I, yeah. and I come there once a month and you know I don't want to screw them over and I'm not trying to steal their plate or anything but to me I felt like also like if what would we, I, I think we were even walking and talking like what would we do if they said something to us as we were leaving I would basically just be like well look I love your restaurant but you don't have any environmentally friendly options mm -hmm. and I'm just gonna bring this back I'll take it home and I'll clean and just explain to them and, you know, maybe they would have thought it was weird, but they probably would have made an effort to accommodate me, or maybe they would say, you know what, we're going to start trying to figure out something better than styrofoam. So there's different options like that. But yeah, to me, it's like, it may, it's a silly story and it's something simple, but I just, even those simple things, like, you know, when you, when you're not consistent, those things add up a lot. You're like, oh, well, I let myself have styrofoam today. And then I used a plastic bag today. And then I used that throw away plastic yeah. silverware and, and then you just by the end of the day you're like wow I just created three pounds of trash because I was just being yeah. wasteful you know and it just involves being a little bit more prepared you know obviously if I didn't want to have to take the, the, the plate then I just need to bring my own reusable uh, 
bowls yeah. and silverware and stuff. We actually just went and bought some today for the next part of the tour because again, we're just trying to be more uh, yeah. more environmentally friendly. And one of the things that we're realizing both as part of the tour and just in general is that if you're going to try to be environmentally friendly, be less wasteful, you have to be better prepared because yeah. that's what it comes down to. Like if you don't, if you didn't prepare and think ahead to have food, and then all of a sudden it's like late at night and you're hungry, you're not going to have the best options out there, you know, yeah. for what your food's going to be first of all, but also what the what's it what's going to come in. It's probably going to be coming in like styrofoam, like you know, because usually only late at night there's like fast diners food. that are open, diner foods, fast food, stuff like that, you know. So yeah. it just involves being a little bit more proactive, thinking forward, thinking and trying to uh, you know, have that consistency. I love this because it gave me so many ideas. So definitely wasn't a silly story to share. I mean, there's you know, obviously what you already said, like maybe they'll consider you know, using more environmentally friendly products, which the restaurant I work in already does, but you can take that a step further and go, wait a second, if, that, you know, if you're eating at a restaurant that you eat at all the time in your neighborhood, it's better for you and for them financially if you did something like take the plate home and return it in the morning, you know what I mean, or bring your own stuff. And this is something at restaurants, there are a lot of restaurants out there, particularly in large cities like you and I both live in, that are increasingly becoming committed to, you know, taking environmental actions. It would be awesome if some of these restaurants participated in a program where you got a small discount if you brought your own to-go things or you got, you know, or it's just some kind of thing. This could become like a thing. And it's also a great, it's like uh, remembering to bring your reusable bags to the grocery store. It starts to make you more conscious of everything. So um, I really liked where my mind went with all of these ideas after reading your post. So I think there was... Actually, in some ways, those are, um, you know, sometimes mean more than the posts that we think are super big and important, you know? So, um, yeah, wow. I really love that. I'm and glad awesome. it had an effect, and I appreciate knowing that. Yeah. Okay, so let's move on. Um, you know, you, you have your third book that just came out with you and John Vibes, and maybe next time we'll have you back, we'll have John as well, because I've never spoken to John. Um, I know he has been uh, fighting illness and whatnot, and I have a lot of respect for his work and what he's been through. Um, can you tell us about the new book, the Manifesto of the Free Humans? Absolutely. It's uh, been a big favorite topic of mine for the last few months now. So the book came out uh, in April, early April at the Free Your Mind Conference, which has been a tradition for this whole trilogy between John and I. Uh, we released our books the last three years <clears throat> at the Free Your Mind Conference. So this one was no different. And basically, the Conscious Resistance Trilogy that I know I've talked to you about the other two before, that you know, the, the first one is seen as the body of our work because it encompasses everything that we're talking about from introducing the history of anarchism to spiritual beliefs, to uh, religion, to psychedelics, to meditation, to agnosticism, a whole range of topics and really just trying to get people's, the wheels turning in people's minds and, and kind of touch on a bunch of different areas and try to tie it together and, uh, and really just get the conversation started. That's what it was meant to do. Whereas the second one, Finding Freedom in Age of Confusion, was definitely more focused on the emotional side of things. Uh, the heart is what we call it, the, the heart center. And this one, Manifesto, we consider it to be more of like the brain because this is as practical as I think John and I can get uh, until future books maybe. Uh, but it's, it's part philosophy, it's part history, but the bulk of it is really just aimed at giving people practical steps and ideas on how they can create more independence and freedom in their lives through this message of decentral decentralizing. Um, and of course the spiritual aspect of it and the uh, consistent act aspect of it, which is where the holistic anarchist message comes from. And uh, I just want to define that for the, the audience. You know, when we're talking about anarchism, I'm sure you guys are aware that this doesn't mean the, uh, you know, looting and rioting, throwing Molotovs and things like that. It just simply means, the awareness that each individual owns themselves and that they are free to do as they please as long as they're not infringing upon any other person's ability to do the same. And it's a rejection of authority. Uh, so this lends itself towards a rejection of government and as well as corporate power and any sort of undue, unjust power over another human being. And along with that, when you look at the word holistic, holistic comes from the philosophy of holism, which deals with whole systems. So when you talk about holistic, you're, you're talking about the whole system rather than the individual parts. So for example, holistic ecology studies the environment and humanity as one object rather than as separate features on the planet. It looks at it all as one system. And in the same sense, you know, people, they think of holistic, they think of sometimes like uh, new age medicine or whole, but when you really think about holistic medicine, as opposed to Western medicine, which just attacks the symptoms, Holistic medicine tries to find the deeper root causes, 
whether they be, you know, physical pains or spiritual or emotional traumas, things that ha have now led to physical traumas. So uh, holistic in general, that's all that word means is just looking at whole systems. So when you combine that with a holistic and then the anarchist message, to me, what that brings us with a philosophy that says it's equally as important to understand um, who you are as an individual to get you to know yourself on a deeper uh, level, whether that's just through simple self-reflection or meditation or, uh, you know, group therapies or, uh, you know, shadow work, any kind of personal development type skills. That is just as important as understanding um, why non-aggression is important. It's just as important as trying to unplug from the economic matrix and investing in precious metals or cryptocurrency or alternative currencies or barter networks. It's just as important as unplugging from the state's education system and, you know, homeschooling or unschooling your parent, your kids when possible, or just generally taking more involvement with your family's lives. It's equally as important to, um, you know, unplugging from the, the support of the police state uh, by, you know, creating community defense, neighborhood watches and these kind of things. So holistic anarchism says that it's not enough to understand the philosophical reasonings and why you want to oppose the state or capitalism or is whatever ism you're against. It's not just enough to know those things and to know the philosophies and to know the ins and outs of politics, but it, it also asks you to get to, to uh, look at your own actions. So one of the ways that we do talk about this in the book uh, is basically trying to get people to, uh, and this is something I'm actually developing now. I may add this later because sort of I, you're the first one to hear about this, but we're going to be, putting the book out again next year, we're re-releasing all the books together as one book that's just gonna be called The Conscious Resistance and it's gonna be like a special limited uh, release. Put all three of the trilogy into one single book and we're in addition to just repackaging, we're gonna go back through each of them and probably add some updates and some notes and just something a little bit extra for people who wanna get, because you know it's been three years and I really feel like everything we're writing is kind of an ongoing, like as I learn more, I'm not changing things I thought in the past, but you know, just adding to it so to speak and uh i think that what i'm developing now though is sort of like a form or a guide where an individual would write their name down and then write down their goals their values and their interests and and break down each of those individually what does a goal mean what does it mean to have a goal and what are your goals short-term long-term goals what are your values what are values what does that word mean look at that area then get people to identify these things and spend some time you know actually getting to think about this okay what do i value what are my interests what are my goals what am i doing with my life going through that and once you identify that then being able to look at uh, your relationships, your habits, and uh, your job, those are the things that are generally closest to you, how you make your money, the people you relate to, things like that, how you relate to yourself, uh, and see are those, your job, your habits, and your relationships, are those in line with your values, your habits, and your goals? And then if the areas when they're not, it's up to each individual to, to have an honest self-assessment with yeah. themselves and to decide what, if anything, they are willing to do to fix this uh, inconsistency. And it's not about placing judgment being like, oh, I'm living more consistent than you, or I'm more off the grid than you, or whatever it may be. Because ultimately, I'm, I just realized that there's so much potential right now, especially, again, this tour is just showing me there's people out there that are hungry and ready for yeah. this and they, and they want solutions and I'm trying to do my best to provide them. But I stress to them that at the end of the day, though, if these ideas fail, it's either because the state is just too strong and we're doomed to fail anyways, or it's because we didn't do anything, you know, yeah. because the ideas can sound nice on paper and we can sit here and I can discuss them with you. But unless people take concrete, tangible steps in their own lives to start changing their actions and their behaviors and their habits to make them be in line with what they believe and, and take the steps they can to reject the state and to reject statism and uh, support of this, these systems morally and financially, Unless we actually take concrete steps to doing that, we're really just, we're just, you know, it's, it's more just mental master, masturbation yeah. than anything. You know, it's just, it's a waste of time, essentially. And so I don't work I, of self-contained flatulence. <laughs> exactly. That's a great way to put it. Yeah. So a lot of this book, The Manifesto of the Free Humans, is the history of the agorist movement, kind of updating Samuel Conkin's work, bringing that up into the digital age. John and I put in some new ideas on how we think no matter what position you are, where you're at in your life, because I'm 32 years old, I'm unmarried, I have no kids, I have a lot of freedom that maybe others are not in that position. And like, hey, I hear you, I like these ideas, but I got three kids, a full-time job, and I can't do that. 
But in the book, we go through different strategies that no matter what you, what position you find yourself in life, steps that you can take to still give yourself independence and lessen your dependence on the corporate and state powers uh, that exist and that are trying to, you know, basically live off the people. So yeah, the book is as, as much a DIY handbook guidebook on vacating, exiting the state as possible. And it's asking people to take that honest self-assessment, get to know yourself on a deeper level, understand what your goals are, look at them and take these steps towards uh, independence and, and empowerment and freedom in the physical sense, as much as the spiritual, internal, uh, emotional sense. And yeah, and, and uh, I don't know if I've told you before, but we're planning on launching an intentional community in 2020. That's where the book ends basically in that, that we're going to do this. That, so my goal for the foreseeable future is to do the decentralize your life tour. I uh, probably am going to be doing it at least twice throughout the United States. Uh, and you know, about to, start the west coast portion next week and do that for the next couple of years and just you know i've realized that these ideas freedom cells agorism this concept it needs i need to be on the ground level talking yeah. to communities and and learning from them and you know sharing my ideas getting an understanding of how other people are working things so that when 2020 rolls around we're going to get some land somewhere in texas and basically launch an intentional community built around these principles and show it in action so that people can yeah. see it. And then at that point, when people are ready to vote again, we'll say, look, okay, we're going to put all our energy into this land project and growing our own food and becoming independent. You guys can go vote if you want. Let's see which one of us feels more free, has more value in our lives over the next four years. That, that, I love that. That's awesome. And um, I, I actually can't wait to make, be a part of something like that. So really cool. And you mentioned just now Freedom Cells. Last time you were here, you gave us a very in-depth description and breakdown of what that was. Can you give us a little update on what you've been experimenting with, how that's going and whatnot? Sure, absolutely. And again, the, the tour is a really big part of this because the, so I'm on tour with my partner, Miriam, and my two housemates here at the Freethinker House who are a part of the, our Freedom Cell here in Houston. So the guys are coming with to share their experience of, hey, these are the steps we've been doing in Houston. You know, we started growing our own food. We're brewing our own kombucha. All, here's how we got started. Here's steps you can take. Check out these apps. Download these things. You know, we're just giving all the knowledge that we've put together the last couple of years, and we're sharing that. And as we're traveling, you know, we're meeting groups of people, and sometimes we're in a room where there's eight to ten people, which is, as you guys know, the size of a freedom cell. So we're sitting there like, hey, do you guys know each other? How many of you knew each other before tonight? And some of them may know each other already. Others are getting connected for the first time. And then we help bring people together so that they can connect in new ways and they can actually start to create these freedom cells. And uh, we still have the website, freedomcells.org is up. Uh, I do want to say that if anybody ever checks it out and it's down for a moment, just give it some time. So, because we have seen, and this is why I, I again stress that I think that I need to be on the ground level talking to people is that just in the last month, um, my buddy Matthew, who's the one who built the site, he reached out to me and said that we were starting to get so much traffic that they're, we're having to upgrade servers because it was shutting down from so much traffic, mm -hmm. which is obviously is a good thing on a platform where we need people. And, I, and I've seen people comment and saying, oh, when I first joined, there was nobody in my area. And now there's a couple of people there. So we're definitely seeing the, the growth of the platform. And it's a beautiful thing. And I imagine that by the end of this tour, once we finish hitting the East Coast in October, that the platform is just going to have grown exponentially. Because, I mean, we're literally visiting 52 cities around the country, telling people about Freedom Cells, encouraging them to join the website encouraging them to download these apps that help build freedom cells and just sharing the concept. So we're seeing a lot of growth right now. Awesome. Cool. So, and that brings us uh, to uh, decentralize your life tour. You've mentioned it a little bit here. You just finished the first leg, which was in Texas and uh, Louisiana, and now you're heading to the West coast. Which I'm very excited about. I really um, would love for as many of our listeners as possible to attend. You'll also be on the East coast later in the year. Can you tell, I, I love that you just said that's a great place to sort of meet enough people to you know, create a freedom cell. That was kind of, I was going to bring that up. I mean, it's a great, um, this, if not, you know, people go for, if no other reason, it's a great way to meet like, like-minded people in your area. But if people attend one of your events, I know some of these events are actually all day long, tell people what they can expect. And yeah. Sure. Absolutely. So yeah, the decentralize your life tour, you can find out all the dates and details at the conscious resistance.com slash tour. And we just actually released a brand new, uh, little short two, tour promo video. It's about two and a half minutes long and it shows kind of rundown of what we did 
um, on the Texas tour, which was two weeks traveling around Texas. We visited 10 cities and we also went to New Orleans. And now we're getting ready to head West Coast and Midwest. And this is going to be the sort of uh, the big chunk because this is six weeks straight on the road just traveling, you know, and, and we're really excited because it's going to be a learning experience. You know, it's always so much learning going along with this. But essentially what we're doing is, you know, we're promoting the concepts that I've just been going over and that I've talked about on this show before, uh, everything that's in the new book. But I didn't want it to just be like a, a speaking tour. You know, here, come listen to me. I have all these ideas, which I obviously I think the ideas are valuable. Otherwise, I wouldn't have written about them and I wouldn't be touring the country talking about them. But I don't want it to just be like, we've got all the answers, come to our events and pay attention to us. So we wanted it to be where we were actually contributing to every single community we visited. So we are taking part in what we call action days. So a, a typical city it is goes something like this. We arrive in town in the early afternoon, sometime in the early evening, we meet up uh, some of the cities we've been feeding the homeless. So maybe we're meeting at a house to cook some food. Uh, we have gone to community farms and gardens to do some volunteering to help them with some of the work they need. Um, in New Orleans, we worked with a nonprofit who hands out clothes and toys and uh, you know different items to some of the poorest communities in New Orleans. So whatever it is, whether it's cleaning up the park, feeding the homeless, um, you know, volunteering at a garden, we meet up in the early afternoon, early evening for the action days, and anybody's welcome to come to that, to participate in that, and to get to learn. And the idea is, again, we're showing people, look what's in your own backyard. We've already had this happen in some cities. People came and saw some of the beautiful farms that we were involved with, and they're like, oh, I've lived in San Antonio my whole life. I never knew this place was here, you know? So right there, they're, they're learning more about their own community, and they're getting to meet new people. And that presents them with an opportunity to get involved and to build uh, community relationships in their own backyard. So that's the first part of the event. And then in the evening, sometimes at the same location or uh, other locations, like we're meeting at uh, bookstores and community centers and yoga centers and uh, meditation spots, different things, whatever, or backyards, whatever the community has, we're willing to do. And for the evening event, it starts out with uh, Miriam leads a short guided meditation, about 15 minutes, talks about meditation, just kind of introduces that to people who might not have tried it. And then my two housemates, they talk about their experience here in the Freethinker House and working with our freedom cell, also um, exploring the ideas that they call anarchist social dynamics. And then I give a, a presentation that's pretty, that's pretty brand new for the tour specifically that I've been giving, uh, just going more in depth into all these ideas and concepts. And then the guys also play music and they close out with some of their music. So we're doing that in every city. We're volunteering, we're bringing meditation, we're bringing discussion on these concepts and providing solutions and music as well and we've been having a great response and uh the whole tour is sponsored by bitcoin.com as as well as a couple of other sponsors that we picked up recently and we're very thankful for that because it allows us to share this message of unplugging from the matrix decentralizing getting the tools back into the hands of the people so that we can create a system that actually represents the health and the wealth of the people rather than systems that oppress and uh, limit our abilities and our freedoms and that's pretty much where we're at. And as I was saying a moment ago, all of my energy is going to this right now. I mean, as you can imagine, there's a lot of planning and coordinating to do this at 52 cities and yeah. all the different stops and the volunteering and stuff. So it's a, it's a labor of love, but we're getting a great response and the Freedom Cell Network's growing. Uh, my audience is growing and uh, we're going to do even more cities next year because since we've done this, once we had the date set, we, you know, we couldn't really change it up. Uh, but we've been actually contacted by about 65 cities that wanted us to come out. So by next year, I imagine it's going to be even bigger, uh, probably a longer tour and hit some new cities. So if we don't hit your city this time, uh, you know, if you're somewhere close by within an hour or so, we'd be happy if you could make the trip, come hang out, come talk to us, let us hear your story. It's been great meeting people and we look forward to meeting more people on the road. Well, awesome. Well, thank you, Derek. Um, you know, I just uh, want to thank you for all the work you do. You're one of my favorite people in this independent underground media space. You're someone I never have to worry about your integrity or your moral compass. And I, I appreciate that because it's fine to hard, hard to find voices and uh, people that you can trust in this uh, in this space. That pretty much wraps it up, up for us, guys. Um, we'll be back soon with another show. The truth is out there. It's inside you. Find it.